This is Public Voice. I'm Scott Festchuk, and I'm with Roger Martin. Uh, Roger, some of your work focuses on why so many products, for lack of a better word, suck. Um, <laughs> could you just briefly outline the conflict that exists between reliability and validity? Sure. Um, reliability is the tendency to produce a consistent outcome, a consistent predictable uh, outcome. And lots of people really like that. Uh, stock analysts like that. They like you to hit your your quarterly earnings target right to the penny uh, more than they like almost anything else. And that's, that's a desire for reliability. Uh, the force of validity instead is trying to produce an outcome that you really want. Um, so if you think about uh, IQ testing is a good, good example. Uh, if you take the Stanford Binet IQ test multiple times in your life, you'll get the same score, virtually the same score. That's a reliable test. The problem they found out is it doesn't actually predict much about how you'll do in life. <laughs> right. Other than that, it's really good. Um, <laughs> and uh, what, what, uh, what you want is a test that actually predicts uh, uh, what's going to happen in life. And so Daniel Goldman, the uh, 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 fellow who wrote about emotional intelligence, says IQ testing isn't very valuable. You need to judge somebody's emotional intelligence to figure out if they're going to be successful. Right. That is less reliable. Uh, if you test for your emotional intelligence, depending on who's doing the test, you'll get different, different uh, categorizations. And so there's this trade-off. To get something that's more valid, you typically have to take more things into consideration with fuzzier variables, things that are harder to measure to get the outcome you want. Uh, uh, and if you want reliability, measure narrower things in the case of the Stanford Binet IQ test, how you do little logical puzzles right. uh, where you can uh, measure them really simply and objectively. And so those two things get traded off against one another. Do you want consistency or do you want the outcome that you'd really like? And you've taken those two ideas and uh, I know a lot of your work is focused on the business world and, and in particular the area of design, mm -hmm. design thinking. Mm -hmm. Could you just e explain in the business context how those two ideas fight against each other? Sure. Uh, companies often say, boy, we'd like to be innovative and have new you know, ideas, but then they spend all their, their time regressing the past, saying what's, what's happened in the past and let's project that uh, uh, through to the future. And if you can't prove something from the past uh, w using past data, we won't do it. And then they wonder why they don't get any, they, they right. don't get any innovation. Well, it's because they want something that's reliable, that's consistent with the, with the, uh, the past. To get something that's valid, you will only get proof of that by the unfolding of future events. Uh, and so if that's your, if your standard of proof is prove something via the past, you will never uh, get a new idea and something that's, uh, that's uh, valid. Uh, so, it, you know, Harvey Weinstein's known in, in the movie business known as having the golden gut, right? right. He, he says, I think Pulp Fiction and The Crying Game are going to be, and the English patient, are going to be fantastic uh, movies that nobody else does. Can he prove any of those things? Answer, no. Right. They get proven only by the passage of, of time. But that's hard for many corporations to say, I will bet on this thing about the future. Well, and it's interesting because at the time he made those predictions and the time he was running what was a, a very small operation, yes. more of an entrepreneurial upstart versus a corporation that's producing $70 million movies and, and so on. Exactly. That's the conflict there, I take it, that a lot of these entrepreneurs are more into, you know, clever design, for lack of a better thing, yes. validity. And as they get more experience, as their businesses grow bigger, what happens then? Well, they get a board of directors, public shareholders, <laughs> stock analysts, chief all of whom, officers. and a chief financial officers, all of whom are more reliability oriented. Uh, and it becomes harder and harder for them to continue to do the thing that that uh, helped them succeed all along. And there are, there are f exceptions to the rule, of course. Steve Jobs, Apple being, being a case in point. Who could have said in advance these goofy, tangerine-colored uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Fuqua computers would, IMAX, would, would succeed? He said, I think they will. And since I'm in charge, we'll try it. And sure enough, it works. Same with iPod, same with iPhone. Yeah. But that's the, that's the minority, and in, in each of those cases, there was no proof that w these things would, would succeed in advance. And that is the nature of a, of a new idea. So what's the challenge for a CEO then? They obviously don't want to give up on reliability entirely, but is the challenge for them to try to get as close to validity as they can? 
Yes, I, I, in fact, I'm writing writing book on, on, on this subject, and I say they have to be the chief validity officer uh, in the sense that over time, as a corporation gets bigger, the forces of reliability tend to, tend to overwhelm the forces of validity. And so I think the CEO has to guard against that and be the protector of validity and say, you know what, we have to try new things that can't be sort of proven absolutely uh, iron ironclad in, in advance. And if he or she does not take that stance, generally speaking, nobody else will and reliability will win and the corporation will fade into nothingness over time. Well, it's interesting. Well, in, in, you know, thinking beyond the corporation itself, are there implications or lessons for the broader economy too? I, I think so. I, I, what I worry about is that we, uh, we have tried to get ever more scientific and, and the scientific method tends to, tends to depend on, on inductive and deductive logic, uh, right? So having, having understood through the course of time these absolute rules and deducing things using those, or inductively. Now with statistics, we say, I, well, I looked at a thousand samples and 990 of them said X, so I can prove that to be the case, right? Mm -hmm. That's, I would say economics, medicine, a lot of fields have gotten more scientific. And, and there's an interesting turn of the 20th century philosopher, logician, Charles Sanford Peirce, who said, that it's, it's interesting that the only two lo types of logic we accept are inductive and deductive, but you can't actually demonstrate that any new idea in the history of the world came about through inductive or deductive logic. Uh, so he said there's a third kind of logic, abductive logic, which is the logic of what might be. He said it comes by way of a creative leap of the mind. And I think in the broader economy, what we have to do is recognize uh, that if we say prove it, and prove it means using inductive or deductive logic, we are ensuring there will be no new ideas uh, that take uh, shape. And that's, and that's a pretty big deal. So I worry about the greater uh, move towards scientific, uh, making everything scientific, if you will, because one thing the scientific method doesn't talk about a lot is where did those hypotheses come from in the first place? Yeah. And I think they come from a logical leap of the mind, a creative act, and we need to make sure we foster that.